So I'm going to talk to you about, uh, about three things, really. The first is why do we have to change what we do in terms of women practices? Then I'm going to explain uh, how we get around the thorny problem of reducing worm usage to prolong the lifetime of those drugs, but without having production impacts. And that is a bit more complicated than what we're used to. So it's worth spending a little bit of time uh, going through the principles, because every time you apply those principles, they're going to be different <coughs> on every farm. Uh, and you'll find that out in the third part of the talk, which is discussing the, the IP project. We work with seven farms, um, cattle and sheep, to try to work through these issues. And every single farm is different. The solutions that were workable were different. The problems they ran into were different. So what we're not going to be able to do is replace one set of protocols for worming treatment with another set of protocols that you all turn up, learn about, go back and apply. It's really not going to work like that. And, uh, and I'm going to apologize, but only once for, for making worm control complicated. It's not my fault. It's because of these issues. And the, the chief among them is, is antimalintic resistance, drench resistance, which leads to production loss. I've been uh, at Queen's University for five years. I was in Bristol Vet School 15 years before that. And we were finding sheep farms quite frequently who couldn't control worms in sheep and couldn't finish lambs on grass. Those farms uh, are not unique to the southwest of England. It's happening all over the world, South Africa, Australia, particularly affected South America. Farm closures on a, on a big scale. Now, if you're in the southwest of England, maybe you can turn to crops. Most of these farmers went into potatoes and things like that. And uh, I don't know what your options are here, but I didn't see a lot of tillage coming over on my journey today, not just because it was dark. So it's a serious problem. You know, ask yourself, what would you do now if the worms didn't work? We do quite a lot of surveys of farms, you know, everywhere really, and, um, and it's quite interesting that we often ask the question, do you believe that worm resistance is a problem for the industry as a whole? And then we ask them, do you think worm resistance is a problem on your farm? And the sort of figures we get for sheep is, do you think it's a problem in the industry? Yeah, 70%, 75% to say, yep, because you've heard of it. Do you think it's a problem on your farm? Down to 20, 30% now. You go out and measure wide trench resistance on sheep farms, we struggle to find a farm where it's working at the levels it's licensed for. And that's a 95% reduction in fecal egg count output. You, you, you don't get that. Quite often you get zero now. Many farmers still use the drugs even though there's resistance, even though they're only working a half what they should be working because you might get a little bit of an impact or you're not measuring it. You're not measuring the impact on the worms. You're not measuring impact on performance quite often. And so it's not surprising that problems don't really become evident until you're quite far down that road of resistance. So it's a good point made by, by Mark previously already that if you, if you do one thing, really it's find out what drugs are working in your sheep and in your cattle on your farm uh, uh, so that you can look after the ones that still work and not continue using those uh, that don't. It's not only antimalintic resistance that's pushing us to change. Uh, if you overprotect young stock, and this is particularly true uh, for lungworming cattle, but to, to some extent also roundworms in cattle, cattle get quite strong immunity uh, against many of these worms by the second grazing season. And um, you, you, you know, going back a few years, even when I was practicing as a vet, you wouldn't recommend worming second season grazers, really. They should be immune from the first year of grass. You might sometimes have to. But you certainly wouldn't hear tell of worming adult cows. And that's quite common now. And that's often done because they're not immune enough. And so you've got production loss. And you, you can sometimes get an improvement in, I know we're not here to talk about dairy, but you can sometimes get an improvement in milk yield by worming adult cows. But relatively few of those farmers will go back and say, why is it that my supposedly immune older animals are still getting hit by worms? They haven't had enough exposure. They've been overprotected in younger life. Increasing concern around environmental impacts, of course, ecotoxicity. So we, these uh, wormers are powerful pesticides. That's what they were designed to do, is kill worms. And worms are more closely related to insects than you think. Nematodes and insects are relatively closely related. So it's not surprising that if you get residues of these wormers in dung, it will, it will be harmful to insects for a relatively short time, depending on which worm you're using. But this is really coming home to roost now. Uh, and when we're talking about carbon sequestration, you want those dung beetles burying the dung and the earthworms recycling into the soil, and, and uh, wormers do get in the way of that. 
And chemical absorption, the number one failure um, of, uh, or the number one um, veterinary medicine residue found in animal derived products is antimintics. And, uh, and so that's, that's worth remembering as well. Not going to go into those other aspects at all uh, in the rest of this talk, only to say that what's good for one of these is good for them all in terms of improvements. So if you improve things so that you use your wormers in a more targeted way, you can achieve good production benefits while prolonging the effective life of the drugs. You also improve immunity and decrease the need for, for intervention in older stock. You'll decrease environmental ecotoxicity and you'll obviously reduce the entry of chemicals in the food chain. So you win on all these fronts if you can get your head around what I'm going to try to tell you in the next part. So wormer resistance is, is an in inherited development of resistance alleles or genotypes. So some worms have genetic makeup that means that they aren't killed by the wormer. That could be they've got a mutation, so the binding site of the drug doesn't doesn't, uh, isn't the right shape for the women to buy into it. It could be something more complicated. The genetics are complicated. But the fact is that in any natural population of worms, you've got a few that will survive treatment. And so, you know, this, in, this, in this slide, the, the resistance is fairly well advanced. So if you imagine the green balloons here are those worms that will be killed by wormer, and the red balloons uh, won't be killed by wormer, then obviously you, you go across with the worming dose, you have what we call a selective sweep. You burst in the green balloons and you leave in the red ones. What happens over time, of course, is that those red ones are producing eggs. They're contaminated pastures. So over time, you get more and more of the red ones and fewer and fewer of the green ones. That's common sense. So what, we do about, what do we do about it? Well, if you do that treatment, and worming treatments are often necessary, then you have to make sure that these red ones don't stay on their own to breed with each other. You've got to put some of the green ones back in there. You've got to reintroduce susceptible genotypes to that population somehow. Where do you get them? Well, we get them in, from populations of worms that have, that have been sheltered from the wormer. They've escaped the wormer. We call those populations refugia. Now, you might not have heard that word in this context before, but a refugia is, is, is just a refuge. It's a shelter. Talk about glacial refugia. So when the ice age, last ice age, came down uh, across Ireland, it got as far as Kerry and no further. So there were glacial refugias in Kerry, and some animal and plant species survived there. And then when the ice melted, they spread out from Kerry across the island again. So refugia, in the context of worm resistance, is you have to generate, you have to create hiding places for those susceptible worms on your farm, whether it's in the livestock or on the pastures. You have to make sure that you're not put in such a strong selection pressure that the only ones that escape are those that have resistant mutations. And it, that does take a little bit of getting your head around because it seems to fly in the face of everything we say in terms of biosecurity and killing everything and vaccinating everything and dipping everything and not leaving every, anything untreated because that would be a source of infection. But if that infection is susceptible worms, that's actually helping you. The trick, of course, is to make sure that that those numbers don't build up to the level that they're causing production loss. So, you know, if there's one thing, you, a second thing you come away from tonight, apart from, from checking whether the wormers work on your farm, it's, it's this concept of refugia, because how you apply it on your farm, where the, the hiding places are, and what you do with your livestock, is going to depend on the geography of your farm, your production objectives, the handling facilities you've got, the attitude to risk you have, it's going to be a very personal thing. So if you've got the principles, you can apply them. I can't apply them. I don't know your farm. Okay, so, so it is worth going through this. Now, I, I don't want you to think I'm, I'm dumbing things down, you know, showing you balloons. Balloons are for kids. So, so um, we're going to move up to Smarties and sweets. All right, so we get this. A classic a hard selective sweep with no refugia in sheep, very popular women's strategy, very successful women's strategy, introduced back in the 80s. Some of you are probably thinking about it already and not going to get you to shout out. Dose and move, right? Dose and move, poor man's clean grazing. If you don't have sufficient grazing, what you can do is worm the sheep, middle of the season, move them on to clean pasture. And that gives you a big um, advance, a big gain in 
holding back the worm populations. The idea being that those sheep have no worms, you move them onto clean grass, and that grass will stay clean to the end of the season, except if you've got any resistant worms in there. So I'll show you what happens. I'll come back to the microphone, don't worry. <laughs> So in a, a natural pop, I've got some galaxy counters here. I skipped my dinner. I haven't had my dinner yet, so this is also a bit, uh, bit self-serving. So if you imagine that the, the galaxy counters, the brown sweets, are susceptible worms. In a normal population, you've got mostly susceptible worms to start with. But you have a few of these mutants. These are the Smarties, so you see the color. These are resistant mutants. So mixed in among the septal worms, you've got some resistant ones. If you worm, if you imagine this is your whole flock or herd, I haven't got enough glasses for individual sheep and cattle, but you imagine that's, that's your, your herd and you come in with a wormer, you're only going to kill the brown ones. What you're left with then, the equivalent number of resistant worms. So you've decreased the worm burden quite a lot. You've probably had a production impact positively, but what you're left with is resistant worms. Now what happens after that is really important. So what you're doing in dose and move, you come into an empty saucer and they're going to lay some eggs. Yeah. You want these to start eating susceptible worms, to start mixing in these brown sweets and get back to this situation. That's what you need to do. But where are they going to find them? You've just taken them to clean grazing. And you can keep moving them. But if all they're ingesting now is more Smarties, that, that proportion is never going to change. You're going to run into resistance really quickly. What you need is a few sources which have galaxy counters on them so that you're mixing that in together. So that's refugia, and I think, you know, hopefully you understand that. I don't want to labor the point, but I want to repeat it in two or three different ways. It has to, has to get through. How can we remix susceptible worms then? So treatment will remove susceptible worms that leave resistant worms. So here the resistant ones are red and the susceptible ones are blue. You treat, you remove the blue ones, you're left with the red ones. These resistant worms produce eggs and contaminate pastures, so that pasture become more and more red over time. But if those pastures have eggs from susceptible worms already, they'll develop to larvae and they will mix in with the resistant survivors of treatment. And that mixing is what will maintain susceptibility. Now, not forever, but you might go from a, a four-year trajectory towards resistance to a 40-year trajectory to resistance against one active and you've still got two or three more actives to go. So that can make a material difference to where you're going in terms of uh, ability to control worms. There are two ways to generate these refugia. One of them is just to leave some individuals untreated in the flock or herd. Now, I'll illustrate this with sheep, but you could do it in cattle, you can do it in horses, you can do it in anything. The principle is that here you've got a group of sheep, you've treated most of them and left only red resistant worms, but a small proportion, in this case one sheep, you haven't treated, it's got a higher worm burden, sure, but it's, it's got susceptible worms in there. And what you're doing there is, is making sure that you've got one of these for every five of these. And everywhere the flock goes, or everywhere the herd goes, this is going too. And that's sprinkling susceptible worms around the pasture. So you don't have to worry about where the refugia is. That flock is going to keep maintaining refugia wherever it goes. We call that targeted selective treatment. It originally was targeted individual treatment, but they changed it to targeted selective treatment, and they call it TST. But it's, treat, it's leaving some individuals untreated in order to generate refugia. That's not always practical. It needs handling. You need to identify uh, those individuals. We'll get into the practicalities in a sec. But it's not the only way. The other way is to generate spatial refugia. And what you, an example of that, not the only example, but one example of that might be early season grazing, where you want to suppress the worm populations early in the season to prevent future pasture contamination. But just like dose and move, if you overdo that, anything that's really effective at suppressing worm populations will also be really good at selecting for resistance. So you can modify this. So to modify dose and move, anyone know modification of dose and move? 
you want to make sure you don't have a clean saucer. So, so what you can do is worm them, wait a couple of days to bring in some more susceptible worms before you move them, or you can move them, let them drop a few susceptible worms, and then treat them. So you can just leave a little window open for a fusion to develop. With delayed treatment after turnout in cattle, that's, that's what you would try to do. So instead of dosing at turnout or three weeks after turnout, depending on the regime, making sure no eggs are shed from those animals, you would allow a few eggs to be shed from those animals. Not too many, you'd allow a few. You delay treatment a little bit. Uh, you take risk away by measuring how many eggs are being dropped on that pasture so that you don't overdo it. Then you can treat the whole herd after that refuger is in place and hope it, it continues to be in place. There are some issues with that around weather, and we've, Francis mentioned climate change, but in areas, and I'm talking about Australia, we're also talking about northern France now, and we're also talking about the south of England. If you, if you have uh, very dry conditions over summer, that refuge is going to be killed because those larvae will migrate into the soil and eventually they'll die. And if you've used long-acting products in the cattle, uh, then your refuge is disappearing and your uh, resistant worms are continuing to be shed. So there's a weather risk, and you don't know what the weather's going to do in August when you're sitting there in May. So there are complications around this. But these are two very good, very effective ways to generate refugia. The science has been done. The modeling's been done. I'm not going to show you a whole load of modeling. You know, there's practical trials as well. This works as a principle, but it's the practical application that's challenging. Now, the trick is to do this without risking any production loss. So what we've tried to do in the EIP farms is take small steps that are low risk to generate some refugia. And then we can ask the question, of how much refugia do you need? The customer always asks for TST. What proportion of the flock do we have to leave untreated? Please give us another protocol. I can't tell you that, because it depends on where that flock goes, what the stocking density is, what the future use of that field is, what the weather does. There's no absolute number. You can't say you leave 10% untreated. What helps us quite a lot is um, in applying target selective treatment, or TST, is what we call the 80-20 rule. Aggregation over dispersion. There's lots of scientific names for it, but the 80-20 rule is as good as any. And this just says that um, the majority of the worms are in a minority of the population. So if you imagine the height of each of those bars would be the number of animals in a flock or a herd, and along the, the bottom, you've got the parasite burden. So these animals, most of the animals, and have really low parasite burdens and really low egg output. But a few will have high egg output. And the majority of the, well, 80% of the worms are in 20% of the animals, typically. So if you can identify that 20% of animals, you use one-fifth of the wormer to get rid of 80% of the worms, and the 20% you don't hit are in likely infected animals, causing no production loss, and creating this refugia that we're after. So a very attractive idea. I used to illustrate, before COVID, I'd illustrate the 80-20 rule by getting people to rummage around and, and show me how much change they had in their pockets, because you'd have most people would have gone cashless, and a few had the odd stray coin, and then you'd always have someone with with two handfuls of, of coppers, uh, and that's the kind of heavily infected individuals. It doesn't work since, because I think, uh, I don't know, I doubt you've got much coins in your pocket. The last time I tried it, not one person had any loose change. Shame if you're having a whip round, isn't it? So how would you identify these animals? Well, the, the, the best and most direct way is a worm egg count, or a fecal worm egg count. You can't do it that way. But individual fecal worm egg counts on a whole bunch of animals, I mean, if you're interested in breeding, um, resistant replacements, and you're going to do that anyway, then yeah, that could work. But in most commercial farm settings, I think that's, that's a big ask, really. So we, we instead look at indirect indicators. You can look at dag skull. So, you know, wormy sheep in particular will get a bit, bit dirty, and you can pick those out. The problem there is the damage has been done. You've had inflammation in the gut. You've had a production loss. You might not get it all back. So certainly treat the daggy ones, but maybe don't wait until um, you get to that point intentionally. 
Weight gain is, is quite a popular one because the very first thing you see when you get uh, worms infecting ruminants in large numbers is a, a drop off in weight gain. That happens within a week or two of experimental infections. It happens before you see an increase in worm egg counts. It happens before you see any dagginess. And if you get it in time, it's reversible. So, so if you weigh regularly individuals, then there are systems that will help you with the data processing as well as the weighing, where you can compensate for forage availability, but you're essentially saying those, those individuals that are not growing as well as the others get a wormer, and if they're doing fine um, without wormer, don't worm them. So weight gain is a good um, way to apply TST, but you need the facilities and you need the time investment to apply that. And maybe that's at scale. So um, when I was still in Bristol, you, you would get this more in, in you know, large flocks in, in Wales, for example, with upland grazing. You, you might be talking about you know, two, three, five, ten thousand 10,000 sheep, and they're coming down from the hill, automated drafting. You know, if, they're, if they're ready to go, they go to the left. If um, they're going back up the hill, but they don't need worming, they go the other way. If, they, if they're really doing poorly and they need worming, you can you know, direct them into a group that gets that. But on, on smaller holdings, it's, uh, I mean, this technology is getting cheaper. On smaller holdings, though, it, it's still a challenge. And, um, and actually, not going to go into modeling, but um, some of my colleagues have. And they came up with targeted random treatment. They found it actually doesn't make a difference how you select these animals, as long as you leave some untreated. Do it randomly. Put them down the race and say, look, one in three, one in five, I'm not going to worm. But maybe you use your judgment as well. So if, if that number three doesn't look great, worm that one and leave the next one. But try to leave a small number uh, unwormed if you can. And don't overdo it. The, you talk about the early adopters. They were the ones that had the most problems, often the case, isn't it? But uh, when we kind of have people walking away from a talk like this in Bristol, some people would go, you know, gung-ho and leave half of them untreated, and then they, they'd be off cutting silage or they booked a holiday and they notice there's a bit of scouring and they, they've left too many untreated. You know, don't run before you can walk. Just get a feel for what you can get away with. It's also worth remembering here that in sheep and cattle, the early season treatments are not so much to protect production. The earlier season treatments are to protect those pastures. You know, as, as vets and as farmers, I think we look to the animals all the time because that's what we're worming and that's what we care about. But worm control is mostly about pasture management and grazing management. So you're mostly, when you worm in early season, protecting those pastures by reducing the number of eggs that are falling onto them. And therefore, you shouldn't be getting a weight gain loss from worms at that time of year. You shouldn't be getting dagginess. You shouldn't even be getting particularly high egg counts. So, so that's probably why the early season treatments, it doesn't really matter what markers you use. You just need to, to leave a few untreated if you're applying TST. Later in the season, it becomes a bit different uh, because now you're dealing with pastures that are more contaminated uh, and then you're worming more to protect. Uh, certainly this time of year, you're, you're worming to try to get those lambs finished. Um, rather than protect those pastures, because if they're shot, they're shot at this stage. Delay dosing, I mentioned. Uh, how can you take risk out of that? Well, this is where Chris McFarland has been doing his, his modeling, and this is a, an example animation of pasture contamination on, uh, on Afby's Hillsborough platform, where we have information on egg count, we have dates in, dates out, we have stocking density, uh, and just by we're using either weather station data, but also just satellite weather data or, or meteorological office data. We can, we can predict when each of those pastures are going to get uh, dangerous in terms of their infectivity, the density of infective larvae on those pastures. And this model works fairly well. It's fairly accurate. So you can, you can see it's, uh, it's kind of going over winter now. It's going to start again in, in May. And you can see by... January, February, you still got a little bit of movement of larvae up and down onto the grass because they, they like mild conditions. But as you go on towards, towards March, they're going to ground. Come, come kind of April, there's not too many of them left. Those, those pastures are, are getting quite clean now. But if you worm animals, then you're not leaving any refugia. If you allow a few of these refugia to develop, not the bright red ones that are really going to become really dangerous, 
later with, with high numbers of L3, uh, and not the gray ones that are completely clean, but a light shade of orange, then that's, that's what you want to get to. Unfortunately, you can't go out and cut grass and measure larvae. You can, but it would, it would take our research group half a day um, to collect the samples and half a day to process them for just three or four fields. So it's not something that you can do practically uh, measure these L3. So this is why we've invested so much time and effort creating these models that will predict and map where the contamination is and where the refugia are so you can apply them to specific situations. So I, rather than go through the whole EIPTSD project, I've just picked out, or Chris has helped me pick out, three case studies that illustrate different kind of situations. The aim of this project was to determine the feasibility and practicality of implementing these strategies, TST and, and targeted treatment, on farms in Northern Ireland. It's all very well reading all the papers from New Zealand and so on, but what actually works here and what are the practical opportunities and practical limitations to those strategies? And that's co-production at its best because we didn't start by imposing a, a protocol. We started by asking what people did, finding out what we thought were, were good things to keep doing and areas that are a bit risky in terms of developing wormer resistance and then try to work through how we could decrease that risk without imposing production loss. So the idea was to determine the suitable approaches for each farm to implement them over a two-year period to assess the impact. And assessing the impact was in terms of overall wormer use, in terms of uh, any production loss, which hopefully was none, uh, as we went in with quite a risk-averse strategy. And then thirdly, uh, we're going to finish up this winter is assess the extent to which those strategies increase refugia on those farms. Two years is too short a period to measure wormer resistance before and after, but we can certainly assess refugia generation. There's a lot of text there, but I, I, it's not there for you to read. That's why it's so small. But this is just an example of how we went in. We went to all, all the farms like this. We identified these areas of good and risky practices. And then we offered options. You might be, look, given what you've told me, there are two or three options. There's targeted treatment or target selective treatment based on weight gain, based on group fecal egg count. There's only a limited number of options uh, out there. Uh, we kind of ranked them in terms of what, what we thought um, might work, but it was the farmer's choice. We said, just try and pick one and see how you go with this first year. And to try to take some of the risk away from that, uh, all of the farms were offered a FEC pack, which is a, a on-farm fecal egg counting kit. It's, uh, it's like a microscope, but you don't have to look down it and count the eggs. You process a fecal sample, and then the eggs are captured in an image, and then the, the computer counts that image up in the cloud somewhere, and it tells you what your fecal egg count is. And that means that you, you can do this with some information. The effect pack doesn't pick up lungworm. It doesn't pick up fluke. Uh, it doesn't pick up coccidia, although it will soon. So we also offered to process additional samples from farms if, if that helped. Uh, for example, screen for lungworm. The so first farm is dairy. I know uh, you're not supposed to be saying too much about dairy tonight, but it's a useful example. So this is a, a dairy farm which started applying these fecal egg counts uh, using FEC pack. And the, the first grazing season calves were, were dosed based on how many worms were coming up in the FEC pack and also live weight gain. And as a result of that, in last year's uh, trial, the number of doses needed was reduced. And more importantly, probably, that first dose was delayed such that refugia was set up on those pastures early in the season. So that's great. So you say, well, that, that, I can already tell you that's positive. There's no production loss. It was refugia generation, the reduction in wormer use. That's what we're going for. So the temptation is to carry on with more of the same, and, and that's what they did. Um, however, in the very early uh, fecal egg counts, came up really high. I'm not sure why that is. It could be that there was late season grazing on into November and there wasn't sufficient diet for larvae. It, there's on-farm factors that we don't have sight of, but the fecal egg counts were, were high early on. But that was okay because at least there was a fecal egg count and then those animals were wormed. My point here is that... Uh, the same strategy might not work exactly the same in two different years. The weather's different every year, and there are management factors that change every year. So if you apply TT or TSC strategies, it comes with the territory to have some monitoring and some flexibility uh, to roll with those changes. So actually, the number of 
Wormers needed this year was higher than last year, which you might be surprised because it was a, a dryish summer, but spring transmission was quite high. Uh, the, the effect pack and live weight gain are still being used as treatment indicators. But reassuringly, the egg counts of second season grazers, so those that had less wormer last year, remained low throughout the season, and there was no need to worm them at all uh, until pre-calving, whereas before, second season grazers were, were regularly wormed. So, um, so this is a positive. This is a reinstitution of immunity. Second case study, and we'll, we'll hear a little bit more from the horse's mouth about this, uh, you know, not an unqualified success, but that's why it's important to, to do these studies so we don't recommend something, send lots of people out, and then they come a cropper. So um, here we are, three batches of cattle, uh, fact pack being done regularly, partly on individuals to, 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 um, to identify individuals that have issues. Antimentic treatments were reduced and delayed. Uh, and, um, you know, fact pack counts for roundworms weren't all that high. However, there was coughing. So, uh, you know, treatments were applied for lungworm and there were lungworm detected uh, by our tests as well. This year, uh, continuing with the fact pack, more regular weighing. Again, though, in both first and season, first and second season grazers, the biggest obstacle to applying TT and TST for roundworms in cattle on this farm is lungworm. And that's, that's going to be problematic. I was on a farm in Mid Wales last week. I was a father-son team. It's a dairy operation. And they were trying to reduce wormer use. And, um, and the, 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 they've started vaccinating for lungworm again after nearly a generation of, of dropping it. So the dad remembered applying this finicky vaccine that came in bottles that you've got to drench the animals. Uh, and then, he, as he said, you know, the vet came in and said, we've got these wonderful new wormers. Yeah, don't bother with that anymore. Just worm them all the time. And that's what they did for quite a long time. Now they've got roundworm resistance problems. And there you go. Son is, uh, is digging out the vaccine again. So I think uh, it doesn't always fit the management, particularly, um, particularly with the time of carving, carving onto grass. It's, it's difficult, but we have to get a grip of lungworm if we to get a, get a grip of roundworms and refuge regeneration. We can discuss some more, perhaps. The sheep example uh, was applying TST based on FEC pack and had live weight gain. And then if any were daggy, they were also wormed. Quite good uh, regular use of the FEC pack. Fecal egg counts high throughout the season. And sometimes that's what you're going to run into. You think, well, I'm going to do FEC packs and I'm going to, or other fecal egg counting or live weight gain, and I'm only going to treat those that need. And then you find that they need a lot of treatment. And that's okay. Not every farm is going to be able to reduce wormer use. Uh, it's not about reducing wormer use. It's about targeting it, making sure it's only applied when necessary, and preserving some refugia. If you're treating so regularly, you can't generate refugia, then one thing you can do is apply what we call a break dose. So inevitably on this farm, regular treatment would have built up more and more resistant populations. That's where you're at. But then one of the newer actives like Monopantel, Zolvix, will hopefully kill those. So you apply break dose to wipe these out, reset the system, and then, uh, and then you know, hopefully go back to something like this. But you need refugia in order to be able to do that effectively. Antimentic treatments, therefore, didn't decline on this farm. They were maintained at about four per season in lambs. The biggest change this year was, was uh, not worming ewes at lambing, and that was, um, that was a bit of a hunch, I think, something that the farmer wanted to do for a while. But of course, you could, you could we, we could have checked last year to see how many eggs ewes will typically put out onto pasture, and then we can quantify the risk in doing that. But so far, it seems to be going OK. Treatment is now applied to lambs that are growing less than the target weight, so less than 200 grams a day. Uh, uh, there's a, there was a business development group meeting and, and webinar, which Chris explained and expanded on, on this particular case study, uh, which uh, I don't know if that's recorded and accessible. We can, we can maybe get you a link if you're interested. But again, no two years are the same. And the big challenge this year was even though it was drier and perhaps there was less of a worm impact on this farm, there was also less grass. Parasites are a nutritional disease. Parasites work to push the animal into protein deficit, particularly. So if you've got a nutritional strain, then a smaller number of worms will have a bigger impact. And so you're also going to come into that weather variation. This year, though, the latest treatment quite recently in this farm applied TST and managed to leave 29% of the lambs untreated based on this target weight gain. And so that's a reduction in worm and that's refugia generation. 
So the conclusions from this study, and it's not finished yet, we're gathering the last of the data, we're going fishing for what's missing, so we can start do our analysis properly and run these models. Uh, so we, we still have a little way to go, but we have shown the worm treatments can be targeted effectively on farms. No one protocol fits all farms or works equally well every year, and so monitoring is crucial to ensure that you are able to maintain refugia without production loss, and that takes some effort and a, some mental effort as well. The first steps, though, can be very small and, uh, and very risk-averse, uh, and then you can develop the system that suits your farm. Next steps, well, uh, as I said, complete the study, so we've got a more solid evidence base from this important work. Uh, we can quantify, then, the likely savings in worm use and, and resistance development of these different strategies. I suppose outstanding questions, though, as, as can practical challenges be surmounted on all farms, and this is where Chris's maps could also be handy. It might be that you can't generate refugia effectively within the, the, the flock in its normal kind of management, but what you could do is, you know, analogous to the medicinal paddock system the trialling in New Zealand with mixed species swords, you know, you can, you can have a refugia pasture, you can have a pasture that's not a set aside, but that's, that's grazed intensively with susceptible worms, uh, and you set up the refugia there, and you've always got somewhere to go back to. If you have to do whole flock treatments and you can't maintain refugia elsewhere, or the weather is particularly dry, or something, something doesn't work out, then you, you, you always know where, where to find these guys to restock with susceptible worms. Where will the advice come from? I think that's a big problem. I think the, the, you know, the vet's always been in a tricky place with recommended worm control because they're kind of close enough to the, the theoretical knowledge, but maybe not close enough to the day-to-day -day management of the farm. And then, you know, farmers, it's, it's difficult to, to ask that much bandwidth of you when you have so many other things to think about, to upskill and to apply these principles. So, you know, CAFRI's got an important role there as well, of course, in AFPI and AgriSearch. 